Hello, everyone. We are just about to get started with today's webinar. Um, we're going to let uh, attendees trickle in to the uh, audience uh, before we get moving. Um, and I want to welcome you all to another uh, Drupal Association hosted webinar, this time with our partner Tag One, to talk about a really interesting and really powerful case study. Before we jump right into the content, I'd love to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, which is, as you join us, feel free to use the chat link in the Zoom toolbar if you want to say hello to each other, make introductions, um, uh, chat about the presentation as we go. You certainly are welcome to do that, and we encourage you to do that. We'd love to know where you are, where you're coming from as you join us. Also, um, we're happy to take your questions as part of this presentation. Um, we'll have a section for Q&A at the end of the presentation in particular. Um, so go ahead and use the Q&A tab if you have any questions as you're joining us, um, and we'll try and answer all of those there. Uh, live captioning has been enabled on the slides, it does as well as a machine can, so um, we'll see how things go there. And again, welcome and thank you very much. All right, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, this is the Drupal Association hosted webinar with our partner, Tagwan. We're going to talk about building an internet for a global 10 company, uh, driving innovation, fostering real-time collaboration with YGS and Drupal. This is a really powerful uh, case study about an organization using Drupal at a scale that's beyond most of what we can comprehend, uh, an organization with over 150,000 employees. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from this presentation um, from the uh, sneak preview I've had myself, and I hope you all enjoy it very much. Um, so with that, let's give some introductions here. Um, so my name is Tim Lennon. I'm Hestinet on Drupal.org. I'm the CTO here at the Drupal Association. Um, been in the community for over 15 years, and I'm sure you've seen me around before. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone joining us. If you don't know more about the Drupal Association, you can visit us on Drupal.org slash association. You can become a member. You can support the Drupal project by supporting us as the nonprofit foundation. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to Michael Myers, the Managing Director of Tag One Consulting, to uh, introduce himself and kick us off. Awesome. Thank you, Tim, so much. Really appreciate you having us. Uh, to everyone who's joined us, thank you for taking time out of your busy day. I uh, hope you enjoy today's presentation. Um, I'm really proud to have been a part of this project. This was an amazing effort across organizations, working together as one team, um, unfortunately, we can't disclose who the client is, but it's an amazing company with even more amazing people that we get to work with. And I'm excited that we can at least share and demo some of what we've done. So before we get started, just a quick backgrounder on Tag1. Uh, we're the number two all-time contributor to Drupal. And we build applications for the largest global companies, as well as well-known organizations in every sector using Drupal, as well as many other technologies. Uh, as Tim mentioned at the top, I would strongly encourage your organizations to support the Drupal Association. It is very meaningfully driving our business. It's why people come to us. It's why people want to come work for us. Your engagement and involvement in the community and your support of the community will be an investment that returns massive dividends. Uh, we are also uh, one of the Drupal 7 extended support providers. And Tag One Quo, which is our extended support product and service, is trusted by the biggest users of Drupal. So if you need to continue running your Drupal 7 site and can't migrate, uh, we have you covered. If your D7 sites are meeting your organization's needs and you have no business re reason to migrate, then you don't have to, uh, and we have you covered. Um, and even if you do plan to migrate uh, and upgrade and you just need more time to do so, uh, we can help you with that as well. Tag One Quo enables you to continue to securely run and build on Drupal 7 for another seven years after end of life in November of 22 next year. So uh, I'll start today's case study webinar with a quick background uh, on the internet, along with some usage data, just to kind of put things into context. Um, then we're going to talk about the growing pains and the challenges and what happens when a popular application can't continue to keep up with the pace of innovation that an organization requires. And we're going to touch on a really interesting challenge and unintended consequence that arose from the company adopting more and more SaaS products and building more and more internal tools. 
Uh, then we're going to focus on how we address these challenges by building a new intranet using rapid prototyping and highlight some of the cool things we did, like real-time collaboration in Drupal. Uh, we'll give you some uh, insight into the results and hopefully leave some time at the end for questions. And Tim, uh, please feel free to jump in as we go. Uh, so to kick things off, a uh, quick background on the situation that led to this project. Um, to give you a sense of things, um, this internet is a truly mission critical system that's the, at the heart of one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, it serves a very large and very active global user base. Uh, nearly one in three people that can access the system use it every day. Uh, there's thousands of spaces or groups or whatever you want to call them in the system. That's where individual teams or projects or products or even special interest groups are going to get together and they're going to collaborate on that thing, that topic. Uh, and these spaces contain millions and millions and millions of pages of content in many, many languages. Uh, there's over half a million files in the system, another 500 something thousand stored elsewhere and referenced. Uh, it's running on a massive global infrastructure that's fault tolerant to ensure it's like incredibly fast and always accessible. Um, and, you know, it is an important part of how this organization collaborates. Um, in addition, you know, this, uh, in addition to the internet, the organization also relies on a lot of other tools to foster collaboration and drive growth. Um, like most, uh, they're adopting and relying more and more on SaaS solutions, things like Slack, Box, Quip, Tableau, Rike, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and it's great because these enable their teams to use the latest and greatest tools, which helps keep them on the cutting edge. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a huge benefit for the company. They also have a fast growing number of internal tools and applications that facilitate getting things done. You know, whether it's something that only they can build because it's internal or like the internet that we're gonna talk about, something that they wanna build because they want a lot more control over it. And having this ability to create all of this custom tooling is another huge asset. And so by enabling their teams to use the tools that they want, that they feel are the best for the, you know, the job that they need to get done, they're providing a tremendous amount of room to maneuver and execute. And that's really critical to their success. Um, however, <laughs> the popularity and the heavy uses of these applications, uh, you know, to, you know, what really drives a lot of their productivity and getting things done created major challenges on, on two critical fronts. I think this uh, is something probably all of us in the audience can can imagine, um, as we've all also adopted, maybe the Google Apps Suite and Slack and all sorts of and and Trello and whatever else we've built. Um, and now we have to say, where is the canonical place where X, Y, or Z document or decision or question even lives across all of our systems? Um, I certainly uh, sympathize and can hardly manage it on this scale. It's crazy, and it, it just it spirals out of control. You know, I. Um... On, on a scale that is, you know, becomes unfathomable and it has a counter, you know, a counter impact. Um, the, um, yeah, um, the, the first, you know, their intranet was crazy successful and it, and it had been for many years, but it was becoming clear that the software just wasn't going to continue to keep pace with the organization's need. Um, it was built on top of a very, you know, well-known popular uh, intranet software and the vendor who they pay a lot of money and have a great relationship with kept saying, yeah, you know, we can add these features. It's on our roadmap. We're going to do that. We understand you need this functionality, but somehow they consistently fail to deliver, which is crazy given who this company is. Um, and, you know, another problem was that the, uh, the software wasn't scaling well. And so, you know, the, the more people were using it, the more content that, you know, they were creating, the slower it seemed to be getting. And, and that's, obviously very problematic, you know, it's sort of self-defeating. Um, and users wanted significantly more control over everything, you know, from the content they created to the layout of these groups and spaces, um, to being able to dynamically pull in content from other data sources and applications because of what Tim was talking about. Um, 
And, you know, this led to user frustration. So they started to see little dips in numbers. You know, people were, you know, the product team is like vigilantly analyzing data and trends and on top of this system because it is so important to the company. When they start to see that people are getting frustrated and, you know, that, that productivity is dipping, that's something that they need to get out in front of. And so, you know, at a time when the company wanted to be fostering more collaboration, their internet, you know, which is all about collaboration, was you know starting to hinder it, and so you know this company is known for major innovations, and they set out in search of tools or considering building a tool that could drive that through collaboration, and in particular real time collaboration, which we'll talk a lot more about later. Um, and then you know the SaaS, you know the, you know these internal apps had uh, a, a, an unintended side effect, you know that that now as you know, we've all experienced them start to seem more and more obvious. But you know, when you have multiple data storage systems, project management tools, chat applications, digital visualization tools, and, <laughs> and, and so on and so forth, like, you know, uh, it's really hard to know what teams are using what and things change over time. And so it leads to scenarios that we've all been a part of like, oh man, like, you know, did you put that product description in the Dropbox? Like, I swear I remember you mentioning it, you know, it was it in the team chat app or, oh, it was email, but I searched both and I couldn't find it. Oh, what do you mean you put it in Slack? I don't, I don't, I don't even think I'm in that channel. Like, are you kidding? Like, are you kidding? <laughs> like, I've, heard, I've heard one user in the Drupal community describe the, the advent of Slack, for example, and the way it sort of transformed the way we work to be just an inbox generator. Each channel becomes a new inbox. Yeah. You know? And then it integrates with your other tools and you don't know where you go and all these other things. So. Uh, finding things across them. I have more unread Slack messages at the end of the day than emails now. Um, it's, you know, because an email, at least I can send it off and take someone a few minutes to respond. Slack, they're like, oh, I got you. <laughs> it's, um, and, it, you know, it, it's really great, but they can also end up, you know, taking control of your life. They can end up, you know, inhibiting productivity as opposed to maximizing it. And, and so, you know, you know, maybe some of these problems aren't issues for smaller teams or in certain circumstances, but, you know, uh, pretty quickly they can get out of control, you know, and especially at a global scale when you're working across teams and divisions on a regular basis, you know, that that is extremely problematic. And so, you know, the question becomes, you know, these these systems are great. They have a lot of upside and advantage and we want to enable people to do use them. But how do we mitigate that downside? Right. Like, how do we keep the good and, and get rid of the bad? Um, and then, you know, I think that um, uh, another big challenge they had is that, you know, at every level of the organization, people were a little skeptical at the idea that that we could build a better mousetrap. You know, for example, if a very large company that focuses exclusively on this as their core business, that you're paying a ton of money has continued to fail to deliver, you know, you think you can do a better job. And I think that we were pretty confident, at least on a lot of the things that needed to get done. You know, this isn't this isn't a problem. Um, but where things I think rightfully got complicated is they said, well, okay, you know, I believe you can build a better mousetrap, but that mousetrap has a ton of features. And we're talking about rebuilding all of those and adding all these things they couldn't and adding all these things we want. Like, how are you going to do that in a timely manner? And of course, all of us have heard the adage, you know, you can have a cheap, fast, or good pick two. And so it's like, okay, we believe you can do it <laughs> and, we, and we believe you can build it on a good timeline, you know, but I'm not so sure you can do it in a cost-effective manner. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, we had to step back and we had to say, well, okay, how are you going to prove that you can do all of this? And, and until you can prove it, you know, you're not going to be able to, you know, make it happen. So how do you solve that conundrum? Well, uh, the product owner and uh, his team did a ton of uh, user engagement and interviews and analytics and research. And, you know, this told them, uh, you know, even more than they already knew about this application, which was a ton. Um, and that enabled them to put together a really compelling pitch to key stakeholders and executives because they had concrete proof as to like how valuable and how widely used the system was. And so they said, look, give us the opportunity to put together a proof of concept. And they said, OK, great. And if that proof of concept goes well, we might give you an opportunity to do some more proof of concepts. And if you can continue doing these proof of concepts in a way that, you know, ultimately leads to an application, that's great. And so they gave us an initial bit of funding uh, and some support, and they said, have at it. Um, 
So that initial uh, three months was given uh, some limited funding for the POC, and we really knew that our strategy was going to be, you know, critical to our success. So we had to come up with an approach uh, that would address the challenges that I've mentioned, uh, and we came up with three main components. Uh, and first, uh, we wanted to solve the hardest problems first. Um, we felt that if we could quickly and meaningfully demonstrate uh, success in really difficult areas, it would one, impress, which we needed to do, and two, it would show them that we could make you know, anything doable on a technical front and eliminate that as, an, as a concern or a risk. Um, then, you know, the challenge was there was only so many home runs that we could hit, right? You know, we needed to hit at least one or there wouldn't be a future. Uh, we wanted to hit two at least, but you know, we sat there thinking, well, even if we hit two, that wouldn't be enough if that was all we delivered. So we needed to balance this out with something. And what we did is we looked at that research with a product team and, you know, we looked at what the key influencers and the biggest users loved. And, you know, if we could build that easily and improve upon it, you know, or where there are features that had really, you know, they really wanted and they haven't been able to get, could we do those quickly? If we try to, you know, cherry pick some, you know, low hanging fruit wow factors, um, but we also had to consider, you know, people judge a book by its cover. First impressions are really important. You know, if we just went out of the gate and we built all the, you know, the table stakes, no one would be impressed because everybody can do that. But if we delivered a POC that was just like a cool sort of, you know, rudimentary, you know, stick figure thing, it wouldn't be all that impressive, <laughs> you know. So if we could make it look good, you know, if we could, you know, uh, get some features in there, it would really benefit us. And so we said, well, okay. Let's focus on what we can get for really little cost or no effort on that front because it's going to drive a lot of value. We can't really invest a lot of time into it. Um, so the other critical thing was the architecture of the POC. Um, now you can take certain liberties when you're, you know, doing a, a proof of concept. You can cut corners. You know, you can do things that you just can't do in a production environment with a mission critical application. You know, just completely off the table. You know, um, and so. Um, the challenge, though, as I mentioned, was, you know, if we did get approval to, to turn this into a fully fledged application and it turned out that everything we had done was a throwaway to get there, well, we were going to face plant at that point. You know, we wouldn't be able to deliver that production application in that reasonable time frame or budget. We would have failed. So from day one, we really had to kind of calculate and balance these short and long term you know, needs, which is, is really challenging in the context of all these other things that we need to do. Um, and so we ended up making some really interesting um, and difficult choices. Um, and one of them, you know, ultimately this organization wanted a fully decoupled app for reasons I'm not going to get into, but it made total sense. Um, but we decided, you know, in conjunction with them that starting as a progressively decoupled app would greatly accelerate development. And that's because, uh, you know, a lot of what makes Drupal so popular, site building, layout builder, web forms, you know, these things work really well out of the box with, with a, a tightly coupled theme. And so it's not that you can't leverage them when you're doing decoupled, but we are able to get so much more so quickly. So it was sort of like a, a cost benefit analysis. We don't have to put a lot of effort in, but we could meaningfully demonstrate, oh, there's way better layout control than what you have. Oh, you can create really complex forms that you can't do now. Oh my gosh, you know, and I'll talk about this later. You can pull together views from different data sources and export that into a block. That's crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, this this speaks to what you were saying on the previous slide about leveraging high value, low hanging fruit that might not have looked like low hanging fruit to them, right? Like I'm sure they didn't think that complex layouts would be low hanging fruit or things like that, right? No, it's um, it's it's really important. I, um, it got to the point, like our first demo was so wow, we had to kind of backpedal. Um, so we were like, we had, to, we had to like start setting expectations, like sprint two, you're not going to see as big of a jump. <laughs> you know, like um, it was, you know, it was, yeah, no, it really impressed people as to what you can get out of it. Um, I'll talk more about this in a minute, accessibility, another great thing that you get out of the box. And so, you know, we could still embed things and pull in, you know, with progressive decouple that gave us sort of the best of both worlds. Um, definitely some throwaway components, definitely things we needed to rebuild, but, you know, we needed to get traction and it was the best ratio. Uh, another thing, and, and this, this was the one-two punch, um, 
you know, the internal distributions in Drupal. So we've been working with this company for five or six years now, time flies. And uh, we've done a, a large number of projects uh, across a lot of different divisions. And we uh, worked with them on this internal Drupal distribution that's used across these departments and projects. And we use this as the foundation for that initial POC. And literally in uh, you know, an afternoon, we were able to stand up a site that would have taken anyone else months to build, a team of people months to build. Um, you know, it contained a theme you know, with the company's identity and branding. And so you know, instantly you stand up a site that looks just like every other internal site that they're gonna be using. Uh, there's also instant familiarity in how it works because of the menuing, you know, the content creation, the layout process, the workflows, it functions like every site. And so anyone who's used any of these other systems can jump right in and, 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 and exact, knows exactly what to do, right? So there's like a user benefit to this demo as well. Um, they put you know, tremendous focus on things like accessibility, which I, you know, I just mentioned. And um, you know, we had incorporated numerous accessibility improvements into the platform. And so this went over like a really important stakeholder group. You know, they review and vet every application before it goes live, you know, to meet accessibility standards. So the fact that we were able to, you know, launch a POC that exceeded what most applications do in their initial production release, like, you know, gained us, you know, credibility with these teams that love working with us because of these systems. Um, but there's also a lot of really, uh, you know, great custom modules in the distro that, distro that we were able to leverage, you know, so a really great example is, you know, corporate LDAP integration. So your corporate login is your only login, right? You have AID, uh, and we could grant people access to the POC. So we could say, hey, here's a link, go check it out. Yeah, of course you have access. <laughs> like just log in. Uh, and you'd log in and you'd see, you know, all of your profile data was there and everybody else's profile data was there because we had just pulled it right out of the directory. So, you know, again, it just created this really smooth, powerful experience. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of performance and scalability tuning and that's critical to them too. And so that was impressive as well. And so, you know, I, I really can't stress enough, you know, the, the power of internal open source and, you know, reusing and building upon code from past projects, whether you do it, you know, formally or informally, uh, you know, it, you know, it just wowed. And, and to the point where we had a backpedal and say, you know, this is, a, you know, we were very honest and open with everybody as to like what we were doing. And, and, and this is why, uh, you know, Drupal is a great benefit. And we're actually now automating this into this insane platform where you can, as an end user, go in, click a button in a web portal and spin up your own version of this intranet or any other application and customize it. And, you know, so this really uh, impressed people to the point where it's become productized. Um, Another thing, um, you know, one of the big reasons for creating this new intranet was to address, you know, those challenges that came as a result of all of these, you know, SaaS apps, you know, proliferating in the wild. And I think Drupal is a great choice for this. I've always thought of Drupal as this input output mechanism with a great layer of tools on top. You know, it's just an information broker. Um, but the challenge with these 30 party apps is they don't all do what you want. You don't know what they do, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, for the internet to be the new hub, you know, it had to be able to pull in content from all these different data sources. Um, and it had to be able to be controlled by user as if it was like a first class, you know, citizen. So you need to be able to, you know, put a box file into, you know, uh, a post on a page, you know, it needed to be able to work with a preview. Um, you know, so it had to seamlessly work in the intranet as if it were, you know, a, a capability not coming from box or, or uh, some other system. Um, but the interesting thing that we learned very quickly is, you know, why we could, you know, build and demo much of what was requested with these integrations. It really came down to like each individual platform and what could it do now versus what could it do in the future. And ultimately, you know, we couldn't deliver every feature and functionality and capability that people wanted, even in a POC. But we were able to do enough and gain enough credibility and confidence with people that they could see a clear path forward. And we were able to say, you know, look, uh, you know, Quip doesn't do this. Like that's not going to happen. You know, we can put in a feature request. You know, we have a lot of pull with with an organization given your your weight. But we can't guarantee that. Whereas these people have said it's on their roadmap, and we have a you know a high degree of constant we can confidence we can make that happen when it's available. And so, 
you know, really it was just about making people comfortable with and understanding, you know, this is and isn't doable and here are the challenges that we're going to face in, in going about it. And, um, you know, ultimately they decided it was worth pursuing. Um, this integration piece is really interesting to me because you're walking the line between deciding um, where, when you choose to meet the users where they already are, and when you choose to say, you know, as you say, when you looked at the previous internet tool, when you choose to say this component of it at least should be rebuilt or should be custom. Um, and do you, can you explain perhaps what the process was when you were working with the client about choosing which, which of those kind of pathways you took? when it was the right choice to do these third-party integrations versus when it was a choice to build the feature into the platform itself? Yeah, no, that was something we talked a lot about. You know, some of it, you know, it's, as always, some of it's dictated by, you know, external factors and controls. Somebody, you know, a key stakeholder or team loves Box. You got to have that. <laughs> um, you know, other times, you know, we look and say, oh my gosh, you know, you're paying how many millions of dollars a year to license that application? Like, Drupal does that out of the box, like, 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 like well, you know, um, you know, for, for political reasons, we didn't always necessarily go after those, you know, but that's like one of the, one of the exciting things about the internet and where it's going is they're, they're tackling those things now, actually. So now they're going to those groups that you'll, you know, say tool X and they're saying, we can even make it look exactly like tool X. You wouldn't even know it's not tool X anymore. We even, you know, like we'll put our logo, you know, yeah, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, you know, we swear you won't know, and we could save you, you know, $4 million next year. You know, why don't you give us one? You keep three, everybody wins. <laughs> uh, right. And people are saying, oh, it's interesting. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that's going to be one of the amazing things, you know, but you, you, you got to be careful at the same point too, because, you know, and, and this is one of the things I love about this organization is they don't want to put restrictions and constraints on things. They want to, they want to influence you. They want to provide guardrails. They want to incentivize and decentivize you to do certain things, right? Like, sure, you can stand up a proprietary application, but wouldn't it be a lot less expensive and faster if you clicked a button and spun up a Drupal install? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think this is really interesting, and the the point you make now um, uh, is about sort of whether the organization itself focuses on user like conformity to the tools, right? Do they put that conformity of all their user groups and the sort of training burden of having everyone use the same thing as the way they kind of unify their process, or as you know, this more um, open model where it's about finding the best tool for the job. And letting the users guide how those interact with each other and building something to unify them. So um, yeah. I think it's just a powerful example at a scale that most of us are not used to. And the reality is it's it's a little of both, right? Because they just don't stand up a tool. I mean, they like inspect the code. They, I mean, they put these companies through the ringer before they'll even consider, you know, proof of concepting your application. So it's it's not like they're just, you know, turning on SaaS applications, you know, every minute. You know, they they do an insane amount of diligence. Um, but they do it fast and better than, than, than most we've ever seen. So, um, this, this, this flexible file management thing is, is similar too, in the sense that like, and this is one of the coolest things I thought, you know, it's, it might be a little simple to some people, but you know, when you create a new group, you know, it's really beneficial to be able to create a Slack space and a box folder and all of these things with it at the same time, you know? You know, some people don't have the ability to create a Slack channel, you know, and, and maybe they shouldn't. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's, there's some friction sometimes in the process and there's naming and location issues like your Slack name doesn't match your box name. Nothing's in the same place. And so there's also sort of this organizational advantage of doing it through the, the, the system. But again, you kind of have to accommodate, uh, you know, uh, any workflow to the degree that you reasonably can. So if you want to stand up a Slack channel, great. You can create a group and you can associate a group with it. If you have, you know, the desire to create everything at once, you can. And that stream, you know, IT loves it because like, oh my gosh, I don't have to stand up, you know, six different SaaS applications every time there's a new group. You know, it, it just makes everyone's life faster and easy on the, you know, efficiency and collaboration front. Um, I'll just touch on this real quick. A, a lesson that we learned early on um, another uh, division in the company came and said, oh, we have this really cool thing that we've been, you know, prototyping ourselves. It would be really cool if, if you know, we could take on this search component. 
And I was thinking, oh man, like I kind of wanted to do search because I'm constantly searching for things. <laughs> so I, I thought it would like really help me and I could contribute to it as like a, you know, as a user. Um, but the product owner was like, of course you guys can do it. Like, cause you know, there's only so many things that we can do. Um, and he was really smart because he picked an application that was a nice to have and he handed it off to a third party. And it, you know, later on, unfortunately, you know, outside of their control, you know, priorities changed for that, that group. And so they had to drop this. This is something that they really wanted to do themselves, but they just lost the opportunity to. And in the end, we lost nothing because we never promised it. You know, it wasn't critical to the POC, but had they been able to deliver it, it would have been amazing. And more importantly, it gave us like a working relationship with a user of the internet, you know? So now we were sort of like uh, building relationships in, in, in sort of intertwined ways and getting buy-in and support from, from different groups throughout the company, you know, just like that, that accessibility team, you know, we needed to win everybody over in different ways. Um, so this is perhaps the thing, I, you know, I'm most excited about, you know, to me, uh, collaboration is, it's fundamental to the way that everybody, you know, works, learns, to how we teach. Um, and working together is how we get things done, you know, and, and applications, including content management systems and intranets are all about fostering collaboration. But for some reason, you know, despite the fact that Google Docs came out in the early 2000s, you know, 2006 or so, um, no CMS in the market works the way that we do. No CMS works truly collaboratively. And that's crazy. Um, but I was kind of thinking, I was like, you know, like if, if I'm being honest, like editing content in the CMS has always lagged behind user expectations, you know, like it's always kind of provided like just enough to get the job done. You know, we used to use, you know, uh, MS Word and cut and paste 20 years ago. You know, now we're just using a different tool to do it. Um, you know, we've improved the editors. They've gotten better. But, you know, for some reason, editors just never keep up. Um, and, you know, I don't, unfortunately, you know, we, we've done multiple presentations on this topic alone. Um, async, you know, synchronous collaboration is extremely difficult to engineer into an application. And that's one of the main reasons why applications don't do it because nobody has the budget to do it, or at least until recently they didn't. And that's an exciting change, um, you know? And so, you know, a major goal of this internet was to increase collaboration. In particular, they wanted more you know, real-time collaboration because of their global distributed nature and more people working from home than ever before. Um, and so we talked a lot about this in the early POC phases. We drafted requirements, we did research, identify potential solutions. Um, and then we had to do a POC to show that we could even do a POC for this because <laughs> it was so, you know, it, it was kind of crazy. Um, it, it was a really fun out there idea. Um, and our, our research was really promising. We did like, we went over a lot of people with really cool ideas and, and concrete research. Um, and they gave us the funding with the caveat that we spin it up as a second team, you know, doing that in parallel with our primary team, uh, enabling them to collaborate, but doing it in such a way that we uh, would never block each other. So they were willing to take a bet on it because it was so awesome and would drive so much value if we could deliver but it was too risky that they didn't want to couple it to the other application, um, which is challenging because content creation is. <laughs> um, a couple so, from where it lives, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is one of the coolest things I've worked on in, in a very, very long time. Um, uh, so we added real-time collaboration into Drupal uh, using YJS. I'll give you a little demo here. Uh, YJS is an open source, uh, real-time shared editing framework, and it enables you to make any uh, application collaborative. Uh, so basically, you can do shared to-do lists, whiteboarding, 3D modeling, editing. It, it does everything. It, it just, you know, it abstracts all of the complexity and it gives you a, a ton of flexibility. And so uh, it's network agnostic, for example. And so this is actually uh, in the background, a Node.js application in a client server uh, configuration using WebSockets. You know, um, and uh, I can't show you the internet itself, but I was able to kind of like crop out this. This is an early prototype before it started to look like anything identifiable. Uh, it's running in a pre-launch version of a custom editor we we built, which is another really cool topic. You know, embedding and you know getting all these things into you know your content is super easy if you have an editor. Um, 
But what you see here is two people using the inter internet, working together on a document um, with, you know, pretty much everything you'd expect from Google Docs, you know, presence, awareness, who's online, you know, what are they doing? Where's their cursor? What's highlighted? You know, editorial workflow components like inline comments, global unredo, undo, redo for multiple authors. Um, and it's running on a fully fault tolerant, highly available infrastructure across multiple data centers with users in, you know, uh, geographic, you know, locations across the world from each other with insane performance. Like this, this POC really uh, blew everyone, including ourselves away. It, it was, it was so cool. Um, as an aside, uh, this is totally separate from an independent of the internet project, but I had to mention it because I'm so excited about this collaboration stuff. Um, we also built an open source proof of concept in WordPress using YGS with the Gutenberg editor. And this is because uh, Mullenweg has talked openly, you know, for a long time now about how real-time collaboration is a critical part of the, the future of WordPress and, and their roadmap. And so we wanted to show the Gutenberg team at Automatic the power of YGS and how it solved a lot of the challenges that their early attempts that they had done in the community, you know, we just didn't feel, you know, did it, you know, did justice. Um, and we wanted to show them that, you know, what they wanted to do in the future was actually very doable today. Uh, and we want to add, you know, collaboration to every application, every CMS out there. Um, so whereas the internet uh, was a client server implementation, uh, this is a secure peer to peer implementation using WebRTC. Uh, and what's super cool about it is that any WordPress site on even the smallest shared hosting provider could run this out of the box without installing a single piece of software other than WordPress. So it's, it's pretty wild. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the last thing I want to touch on is uh, you can start to see that there's a lot more to real-time collaboration, and even just a CMS, than shared editing. You know, you saw some layout building there. And so, you know, uh, working together with your peers on the look and feel and the design of your pages is also something that can be done, you know, collaboratively. So, and of course, Drupal supports Gutenberg, so you can take some of that code uh, and, and check it out and, and do some integration yourself. Um, the last big thing I want to talk about, uh, you know, as we were wrapping up the, the POC phases, um, you know, and, and looking more and more likely like this is going to get greenlit to be a full on project. More and more groups throughout the company were weighing in and kicking the tires and looking under the hood. And it was really exciting because we, you know, we, we watched our little POC sort of like snowball downhill and become this, you know, giant beast that everyone was really excited about. But the problem was that that hill was a minefield. <laughs> and, and at any moment, like one of those groups could just, you know, evaporate that snowball no matter, no matter how big it had gotten. And, and that about happened. Um, you know, uh, one of these groups is, is their DBA group. Uh, that supports mission critical applications after they go live. And so you know, we've built many other mission critical applications on MySQL with the company um, and they run their own MySQL apps. And you know, believe me when I tell you, they fire drill these applications beyond belief. You know, they know these systems are fully fault tolerant and highly available you know, monthly. <laughs> um, you know, so they, they have no doubt that, that this can work, but they threw out a challenge and they said, okay, you know, great, but you know, sure, MySQL is supported and, and we run mission critical applications on it, but this is our intranet. This is mission critical. <laughs> There's apparently another level of mission critical. And uh, they have an Oracle support contract that apparently is second to none. Like, I don't know if you're texting, you know, Larry, like, hey, dude, I need some help. Or if there are like oracles, you know, just floating around you waiting to need help. But um, they, you know, their opinion was we need to be able to run this application on Oracle because it's so critical to the company and we have no better way to do it than this package that's crazy supported. Um, whew. So it's not that we were against Oracle. It's that, you know, we're trying to manage risk in a POC. And I mean, I, we are some of the most well-known contributors to Drupal. We've been doing this for 17 years. No one, no one we knew, no one we get a hold of, no one knew anyone who had ever run an active, active Oracle configuration in anything, you know, anything, <laughs> anything like this. <laughs> and 
you know, we, you know, we didn't know what would happen. Like would all sorts of, you know, would this be a major step backwards for the application? Would all sorts of things break? You know, what would go wrong? You know, what does that mean to our timeline? You know, and, and forget about our application. Like, what if this goes live? Like we, we, we battle tested my sequel, you know, over and over and over again, just at this company, like we know it works. Like, so that, that risk, that unknown, you know, our reputation is on the line as much as theirs. It just made us like, you know, nervous. I mean, really, really nervous. But hey, we're you know we're building POCs, and we said, let's see what happens. Um, and so we pivoted because this was you know something that needed to be addressed, and we threw a bunch of resources on in the next sprint. And it's not fun to go into a sprint having no idea what it's going to take to get something done. You know, whether or not you can do it. Like that's not a place that we typically operate from. Even with stuff like real time collaboration, we we had a really good sense of what we could or couldn't do based on the research. And this was like, yesterday you said, do this. And today we're saying, okay. <laughs> um, and we were blown away. Um, it, it took us less than the entire sprint to, to, to build it. You know, There's a good Oracle driver for Drupal. Uh, it did need a couple of enhancements and changes and tweaks, but you know, the, the, the repercussions or, or you know, the ripple effect wasn't there. And that was you know, a huge sigh of relief. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, it was good on one hand because it, you know, it calmed our fears that it could be done easily, but it still kind of nagged us in the back of our mind, is this really the best decision for the company given the unknowns and the risks? Um, what I didn't expect, and this was really interesting, is that, you know, if you think about like a big, you know, Fortune 500 company, you know, these people operate with insane technologies. And, and, and frankly, some of them look at PHP as like a rinky dink technology. Doesn't matter that it powers 80% of the web, you know, they're doing, you know, assembly. <laughs> you know, they're, you know they're like, you know, they are as hardcore as it gets or whatever it is, you know, from their perspective, it's just not what they would use. It's not what they know. And, you know, I, we were so proud, you know, at the end of this, not at what we had just achieved and what, you know, but what Drupal had achieved. And these people who, you know, were, were talking some smack, you know, at different times about, you know, forget about Drupal, just PHP. We're like, you know, even they had to kind of step back at this point and say, wow, you know, th this is, I don't, I'm not saying I love, <laughs> I'm not saying I love PHP, but wow, that was, that was cool. <laughs> that was impressive. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the results, uh, I, I wish I could share a, a lot of information and data with you guys. I can give you some, some anecdotal success stories. Um, you know, it, it is, uh, is a, a, a really resounding success. And, and I measure that in a couple of different ways. You know, one is a project, you know, we, we got through multiple rounds of POCs, literally funding to funding, you know, like we were pitching a startup, you know, it was grueling and it was exciting. Um, and then we, you know, we got to an alpha, we got the green light to go to a beta, um, and it's, it's just been so amazing to see this continue to grow and, and, and go live. Um, another really important success factor for me is that, you know, a mission critical system, you know, certain applications in a company, they should own, you know, and so even though they engaged us to build this with them initially, it was very clear from day one that we were going to help them bring on a team and we were going to transition out. Um, and so, you know, nothing makes me feel better then, you know, getting this up and running, making them successful, and then stepping back and watching them be able to run with it, you know, and, and we'd love to come back in and, and, and we hope we get a chance to do so in different ways in the future. And I'm confident we will. And we're certainly working on many other things, but like to be able to build something and walk away and see it thrive is, is really awesome. And I feel um, like this, that point in particular fulfills one of the promises of open source that's sort of overlooked, which is this idea that if you build solutions based on open source principles, even if it's just an internal open source model, right? The idea is it's not just that you're not locked into a vendor, but you're not locked into an architecture or an idea or a conception of it. And it should be something learnable. It should be something that the, the whole team can embrace and continue to maintain, right? I think it's a really strong measure of a successful project. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, right? You don't want to recreate the problem internally, create your own vendor lock-in, you know, um, with an even smaller pool <laughs> of resources and developers. Um, so this, th th there were a couple of things that really sealed the deal for me. Um, one of them is that teams that are using other tools for other purposes, you know, Confluence is one in particular, you know, are using this as the internet and they're saying, 
oh man, your editor is way better than the Confluence editor. It's like, yeah, because we, we we built on it and we made it better. <laughs> and they're saying, you know, we don't have real-time collaboration and we don't have integration with all of these things. And like, why aren't we using the internet for this? Could you migrate our content into this? Can, and can we like dump this? You know, so that's, you know, that's like a real seal of approval. Uh, another interesting thing, and I can't talk much about this is, but like they have certain things that are segmented and firewalled and, you know, independent. And even these groups, you know, like super high security teams are saying, could we clone this? You know, could we somehow run our own instance, you know, shared code base so, you know, we can manage it. But, you know, um, and I don't know what's going on behind there. I have a lot of insight, but it's super cool to hear that. Um, and perhaps my, my, my absolute favorite <laughs> was, uh, I guess they're really good about, you know, ultimately contributing back to open source communities and, and, you know, they're very engaged in open source, even if they don't necessarily take credit for it. And sometimes it takes organizations a long time to do it. And we were talking about it at one point with a senior executive and he's like, I think we should like productize this and sell this. Like this should be something that like we make as a company. Like, like we can't, we can't give this away. <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't think he, I don't know that he was serious, um, but it was, it was so, you know, that to me was like the biggest compliment of all for them to say like, wow, this is something that, you know, we, we think, you know, consumers and other companies would love to buy from us. So, um, uh, we're, we're running out of time. There was so much I wanted to talk about. Um, you can check out uh, tagone.com slash EOL for more about upcoming end of life. Uh, we've been doing this really awesome 20 years of Drupal series, interviewing really well-known leaders in the Drupal community that have helped make Drupal what it is, talking about their Drupal journeys and experiences, which is fun and insightful. And of course, the, uh, the real-time collaboration stuff with YGS, we have tons of content on that as well. Uh, please check it out. And of course, you can always reach out to Tim or I. Um, I'll try and save some time for questions, though. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Um, so as a reminder to our audience, you can you can go ahead and ask additional questions using the Q&A tab in Zoom. And we also had a question coming in chat, which is where I'd like to start first, um, which was which is a great one. So um, Henry has asked, um, can we can we get some of the sort of technical meat and potatoes like what what Drupal versions? What were some key modules that you used in the PS, POC? Um, were you outright? We we talked about integrating with things things like Slack. Was that accomplished through custom modules? Is that you know what's kind of behind that? Um, well, I guess maybe let's start with sort of Drupal and key modules. <laughs> There's a lot there. as <laughs> much as we're allowed there. to talk about. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll talk about as much as I can. Um, you know, look, I said they're, they're huge supporters of open source. You know, there, there's a, a big reason they want to be using open source. Um, if there was an open source module available, we would always use it if it made sense. I believe the box work, uh, I believe others were working on that in the community. And um, pretty sure I remember uh, uh, Mo Schweitzman and, and Anna and some folks collaborating with some third parties on that. So I, I believe we did help with some existing modules. Uh, there were some things that didn't exist that we had to create. Uh, certainly, you know, for proprietary internal things, those were all custom modules that will, you know, that will not be open sourced. Um, as far as like specific modules, I mean, it really, um, you know, it, it's it's the core stuff that you would expect. You know, I, I can't think of any like esoteric module, like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I've never seen that on a project. Like, um, you know, uh, the functionality that didn't exist, like the real-time collaboration is what we had to build. The stuff like, you know, layout builder and, and you know, web forms and, you know, that show off the power of Drupal, they're already there. So, it, it, you know, it's sort of like those extremes, like where, you know, uh, leverage as much as Drupal, uh, you know, help improve some contrib, only build custom what you have to. Sure, yeah. And, and was that, were you working to sort of keep up uh, on these POCs with like the current latest point releases of Drupal? Was this during the Drupal 8 cycle or the early nine cycle as this project was going on? Yep, um, I honestly don't remember if it started on eight and went to nine, it might have. I, th I think the earliest, I think the initial POC may have been on eight. Um, the, and that was one of the things that we were like talking about for like timeframes, like if we were gonna go to alpha, like when do we, you know, you know, can we get on nine sooner rather than later because of our schedule? And so it was definitely during like the eight to nine transition that like early work was happening. 
Um, ultimately, it launched on uh, you know the, the the latest nine. Awesome. Okay, very cool. Um, let's see here. So I think we maybe have time for like one more question, and I thought I would try and uh, ask one that kind of wrap wraps sort of this um, the unique circumstances of a project at this scale and above. So what is what would you say is is uniquely different about working with a stakeholder of this size on a project deployed at a literally global scale? Um, or is it more of the same? Is it, is it just the same problems at a larger scale? I think it's very different. I really do. And, and I think our success is in large, I mean, our team was amazing. You know, their team was amazing. Like, um, but I, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of like, I don't know what you want to call it, like product, you know, like product management, you know, that, that you do. And I think that you know, the, the, the product manager for the owner, uh, the internet, you know, his, the way he wrapped his head around like what the system does and how it works and how he engaged with, you know, such a large company of stakeholders and, you know, these relationships that he's had and like, you know, like putting together like the plan and winning people over, like, you know, the strategy behind that, you know, the positioning, you know, like ushering this across every stage from idea to budgets, you know, pull, I mean, it, it, I mean, the scale at which they were operating was insane, you know, and, and like, I remember one meeting, like, and, and what I love is they were so like, they literally treated us off if we were like, you know, at the company on their team, like it never once, you know, it, it was like such a partnership. I remember like he would show me, oh, here's the pitch deck I'm going to give to my executive team next week. Like, let's go through it and, you know, give me your feedback. And I remember one day he's like, oh yeah. So, hey, you know, we're starting in this whole marketing and promotional campaign. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like he literally had like in parallel with everything else that we were doing, he literally had like videos being created and like, like, he, like he was marketing and promoting a proof of concept as a fully fledged product out to user groups that we were doing like regular demos to. I mean, like the, the level of orchestration and management that went on to just give this, you know, legs to kind of get to life. I don't think most people on the project even got to see what was going on there. And it was, it was really mind blowing to me that like, you know, we played a, a really important critical role in this project, but there was so much going on. Yeah. So to me, I think there's the lessons to take away from that are, as you say, there's something critical to really strong product management on the inside of the organization you're working with. And that's a lesson for members of our audience who are, um, uh, you know, end users of Drupal who are maybe looking at a large scale project of this sort um, or evaluating Drupal to be used in a large scale project, but also for teams or, or developers or whoever else. Um, about the strength of having well-defined requirements and well-defined process and good touch points um, and really strong representation of users, I think. And I think that's certainly something that I'm taking away from this conversation that's really powerful. Um, besides perhaps the, um, the need for uh, incredible real-time collaboration tools um, and checking out YJS in some more detail. So uh, with that though, I think that's pretty much all the time we have. So uh, I do want to thank everyone again for joining us. Uh, we do really appreciate you taking the time in your day to understand this story. Um, uh, again, for my part, my name is Tim Lennon Heston at the Drupal Association. Um, we'd love to see you at the upcoming DrupalCon in Portland uh, at the end of April. You can find information at events.drupal.org and you can join us on drupal.org slash association to learn about our programs and how you can support the Drupal community. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it to you, Michael, to sign off. Awesome, Tim. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Everyone who joined us, thank you for hanging out through the full hour here. Uh, I love talking about this. I really hope that you guys learned something from it, are excited, are as excited as I am about real-time collaboration and, and all the cool things that Drupal can do. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, Tim or I with questions uh, and make sure you check out DrupalCon. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. For those of the U in the U.S., enjoy Thanksgiving coming up soon. And uh, the Drupal Association, we'll see you again. Bye-bye.